We hear so much about how to get the mind into concentration that we tend to forget that there's also a skill in how to leave it. Because these talks come at the beginning of the period, the skill in how to leave it doesn't often get mentioned. But how you leave concentration is relevant to how you get back into it, in fact. This talk is going to be basically about what you should have done the last time you left concentration as a way of getting you more quickly into concentration this time. The first thing to do when you're leaving concentration is to stop and think about what sense of peace or ease you got from the concentration. And then you want to do two things with that. One is you're dedicated to others. You're going to be leaving concentration. You're going to be dealing with other people. And when you deal with them, you want to come from a sense of well-being, a sense of ease, a sense that you have a source of happiness inside. So in approaching them, you're not primarily concerned with what you can get out of them, emotionally or otherwise. And you feel more in a position that you have something to offer them, and that your goodwill for them comes from a sense of well-being inside. So it's stronger And John Lee's images of a tank full of water. You open up the spigot and cool water comes out because there's water in the tank. There's no water in the tank. He says just air comes out of the faucet. And although the air coming out may be cool, it's not nearly as cool and refreshing as the water. So you want to remember that in your dealings with other people, you want to treat them with goodwill. Because if any ill will sneaks in, that's going to make it harder to settle down the next time you come to concentrate. So spread thoughts of goodwill. Reminding yourself that you're coming from a good place and you see no need that you would want for anybody to suffer, what would you get out of their suffering, especially if you're coming from a position of well-being? Most of the time, we, if we want to see other people suffer, it's because we're suffering. I feel as, much, as long as I'm suffering, let's see everybody else suffer as well. That kind of attitude just leads to more and more suffering. So focus on whatever sense of ease and well-being you already have experienced. And think of yourself as being willing to share that with others. This doesn't deplete your well-being. In fact, it augments it. And if you can maintain that attitude of well-being, then when you come to sit and meditate again, there's not a lot of garbage you have to clear out. You simply Think thoughts of goodwill to everybody, connect up with that initial intention, and you're back where you were. The second thing to do as you reflect on the sense of well-being you may have gained during the meditation is to ask yourself, how did that come about? What was the breath like? Where was the mind focused? What had you done leading up to that point when the mind began to settle down? In other words, look for what worked, and then make a mental note to try that again the next time. So as you're sitting here meditating, you have a sense of where you want to go, and you can go there a lot more quickly if you can remember, well, this is what it was like the last time it was good. So you were focused on the chest or focused on the middle of the head. There's some spot in the body that where you should feel most natural in your focus. Some ways of breathing that are conducive to the mind settling down. If you notice that, make a note of it. And as you sit down to meditate the next time, remember, this worked last time. Why don't we go there right now? and see if you can induce that sense of well-being in the breath. And here the breath means not only the in and out breathing, but your whole sense of the body sitting here, the energy flow in the body sitting here. 
That's breath as well. In fact, that's much more important than the in and out breathing. Because it's this sense of the breath energy suffusing the body that really provides a home and allows you to settle down in the body as a whole. Because you need this larger frame in order to keep the mind from wandering off. If the mind has a very small frame of reference, it can wander off easily, get knocked off its center easily. So if you can notice how the body feels when things are settled in, when it feels good, when it feels refreshed, nourished, at ease, energized, relaxed, whatever feels good for you. See if you can remember that and then try it the next time around. This is especially important if you have the tendency to regard a whole hour as a time to a whole hour to settle down. This is a common problem in the meditation. You have, if you have five minutes, you tend to be a lot more serious about it, a lot more focused, realizing you have only a little bit of time, so you've got to make the most out of it. And then if you have an hour, you think of it as a long, easy slide down. It doesn't have to be too fast, just a nice gradual time. Have a nice settling in five minutes before the, the hour ends. That's the wrong attitude to have. You have to remind yourself at the beginning of each session, you don't know how long you really are going to be able to sit through the session. You may get a coughing fit and have to leave. Somebody else may get a coughing fit. You might die. I mean, it can happen at any time. There are people who have died while they meditated. Not because of the meditation, but it just so happened. So you want to have the attitude that Okay, you can remember where your spot was, you can remember what good breathing felt like. We'll go right there. And if it turns out the mind doesn't settle down, at least you've got something to work with. Makes it easier to settle down quickly. And then the third step at the end of the meditation is to remind yourself that even though you're going to be opening your eyes, it shouldn't push your awareness of the breath energy in the body off to the side. You can still keep the breath going. The fact that you're watching the visual realm doesn't mean that you have to let your attention all go out into the visual realm. You can still have the sense of the, the body realm here, the breath realm in the body. That accomplishes a lot of things. The more sensitive you are to the breath as you go through daily activities, the more you'll be able to see when the mind leaves, what kinds of things knock it off, and how you can bring it back in. If there's a sense of ease in the breath, it's a lot easier to stay with the body. And you can give yourself some tasks to do, remind yourself that when anger comes, when fear comes, when any unskillful emotion comes into the mind, there's going to be a corresponding tension in the breath. The rate of the breath will change, the quality of the breath energy in the body will change. And if you're sensitive to that, you can catch these things really quickly. Where if you notice there's any tension or irregularity, breathe right through it. Try to calm it down again, ease it up again. So as you try to stay in the present moment, it's not just a matter of forcing the mind to stay here. You're giving it something to do and something that shows results. This is especially important when you begin to notice that there are certain trigger points in the body, certain places that tend to tense up first and then create a chain reaction where other parts in the body tense up as well. well if you can hover around those initial spots, make sure that they stay open, they stay relaxed then those other patterns of tension won't have a won't have a foothold. And so you give the mind something to do, some a way to maintain its frame of reference as it goes through the day. 
And from that frame of reference, you can see clearly when the mind is moving, why it's moving, what, what catches it, what sorts of things set it off. It's in this way that trying to maintain your frame of reference, trying to maintain your center, allows you to develop discernment, because you have a point of reference. If the mind doesn't have this kind of point of reference, it just sloshes around. And sometimes it moves you don't really realize why it's moved, because there's a lot of movement going on. There's no one spot where you're trying to stay focused. But if you have that spot, then you can see the movements clearly. And if you've been staying with the breath as you go through the day, when the time comes to sit down and meditate again, you're right here. It's like keeping the mind in a short leash. You don't have to unwind the leash. You've probably seen dogs on the long leash and they get wound up around trees and bushes and all kinds of things, and it takes a lot of time to unwind the leash. Well, that's the mind that's been allowed to wander through the day, which may be one of the reasons why it takes so long for it to settle down. Once you decide that you're going to meditate, you have to keep unwinding the leash from the bushes and the trees. But if you've kept it on a short leash, it's right here. You close your eyes and you're ready to go right back to the spot where you feel at home, where you feel at ease. So it's important to remember that if you're going to settle into the meditation well, you have to know how to leave the meditation skillfully. In other words, you don't totally leave it. You keep one foot in the door. If you're making a comparison with an old image, they talk about concentration being a home for the mind. Well, you want to make it a, a mobile home. So no matter where you are, you've got this safe place, you've got this place of rest inside that you can take with you wherever you go. And although it may be a little bit more bumpy than a solid home, or a home that's got a good solid foundation, you still have a place of refuge as you go through the day. And then when you park it, you're right here. Things are solid again. And because the, the practice becomes more continuous, it's not chopped up into little pieces, it can develop momentum. And John Fuhring once said, that you have to learn how to make your meditation timeless. That means staying with it regardless of what the time is in the day. Our problem is that we have too many times. We have time to eat, time to work, time to rest, time to go to the bathroom, time to whatever. And then the day gets chopped up into times, and our meditation gets chopped up into times. And it's only given a little time in the day to really do its work. The right attitude is to make the meditation timeless. Other times can be secondary, but all the time is time to meditate, to develop concentration, to develop mindfulness, all the right factors of the path. So when you learn how to leave meditation properly, it makes it a lot easier to enter meditation the next time around. You realize that as you leave meditation, one, you're coming from a position of strength and well-being, and you're happy to share it with others. That means you're more likely to do skillful things, say skillful things in the course of the day. So there's less that you have to clean up the next time you sit down. And you would reflect on how the meditation went. Well, that gives you some pointers on what to do the next time you sit down. I'm trying to remember where you center. The mind, when it, feel, when it really feels settled in, what the breath energy is like, and the other factors that seem to have an impact on allowing the mind to settle down. It gives you a starting point for working on that the next time around. You may have missed some points, and it may not work quite the same way the next time, but at least you've got a place to start. Remind yourself, well, maybe I have to develop more precise powers of observation to see what really works or why it really worked. 
it's only taking an interest in cause and effect like this that the meditation can become a skill and become a good foundation for discernment, because a lot of discernment is that issue of cause and effect. And finally, if you can remind yourself that even though the visual field may be really interesting, you've got to maintain the sense of the breath field as well. That's what allows the, your frame of reference to be more continuous. So the meditation does become timeless, a galico, as they say in the chant. So ultimately you realize you never really have to leave meditation. It's a question of how to stay with your foundation even though you open your eyes and engage in other activities. This is why understanding the, the skill of how to leave meditation is an important part of learning how to enter and how to stay. <laughs>